I bet some of you watching right now are wondering how important the sociology of toilets actually is. I wondered that too, as someone who hasn't had to worry about not having access to a toilet. There are two reasons I made this video. Because toilets are actually incredibly important when it comes to who is allowed to participate in society, and because toilets have crossed over into almost every civil rights campaign. Women were the first battleground, then it was people of color in the American South, now it's transgender people, those with disabilities, the homeless, and people in the developing world. One problem is that people don't tend to want to talk about toilets. A prolific writer on this topic is Clara Greed, who says this about toilets in one of her articles. In reality, the topic is not sexy or prestigious, and therefore toilets often appear low in the pecking order in terms of development priorities. I disagree. Toilets are incredibly sexy and incredibly important. We shit all the time, and it's about time we talked about it. So let's make toilets sexy, and let's talk about the sociology and politics of toilets. Two billion people worldwide lack both toilets and clean water. In compact cities, you can sometimes see households with no adequate sanitation across the street from affluent households because of the vast wealth disparity. In Africa, 80% of the population need to go outside, and in India, 90% of surface water is filled with shit. Half of schoolgirls in Africa need to leave school when they start menstruating because they don't have adequate toilets at school. Many developing countries are under-toileted, where there aren't enough public or private toilets, and so people have to go on the streets, where women also receive much more scrutiny than men. So keep in mind, everything we're going to talk about in the rest of this video is much worse in the developing world than in places like the US. The earliest modern public restrooms were in Victorian Britain, and they were mostly for men. This was done to enforce the separate sphere idea, which argues that men and women should occupy different parts of society, like men should be in the workplace and women should be in the home. They argued that men were the only ones who need to go out for long enough to need a restroom anyway, and so why build any for women? Unlike men, women had to carefully plan their routes along places where friends or family lived so they could use their home toilets. This effect is what's called the bladder's leash. Women began to form activist groups for equality. Beginning in 1850 was the Lady Sanitary Association, who were only marginally successful, opening a few toilets. During World War I, women were able to use their leverage from almost one million of them joining the workforce to petition their employers for adequate facilities. But because of the minimal workers' rights in Britain at the time, employers were still able to legally deny them, which finally changed in 1992 because of new workplace regulations. Even after women's restrooms were started being built, women were charged to use them and men weren't. After 1963, public restrooms weren't allowed to charge for use, but private restrooms still were. And after half a century of complaints that this was unfair to women, in 2011, the UK government showed that they were hearing the complaints and issued the Equality Act, which made it so that both men and women could be charged, which is totally what the activists wanted. It's not just that women don't have enough toilets, it's also that women need to use the toilet for longer and more frequently than men. Women are more likely to use public transport and have kids or elderly people with them. Cisgender women need the restroom even more because of things like menopause, menstruation, and pregnancy. This should make it clear that the goal isn't exactly an equal number of restrooms for everyone. It's almost a constant experience at movies and games and stuff like that that the line for women's restrooms is much longer than the men's one, and they have an equal number of restrooms for everyone. One example of a country that's trying to fix this is Malaysia, who has twice as many toilets for women as toilets for men. If governments want women and men to be able to use public transport, work, and just live equally, then they need to make sure women don't have to worry about where they can use the bathroom. In the American South before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it was legal to racially segregate everything from bathrooms to restaurants. While proponents at the time argued that the facilities might be separate, but they're still equal in quality, we all know that's bullshit. Alex Chen describes this really well in their Medium article about the many ways restrooms have been segregated. Quote, 
The design of these spaces is particularly interesting because designated colored areas were shitty as fuck. What's interesting is a lot of the things we talked about last section, like the bladder's leash, applies here. In her article in The Progressive, Elizabeth Ann Thompson talked about going on road trips as a child in the Jim Crow South. She talks about not being allowed in gas station restrooms and having to bring toilet paper and go on the side of the road. She also talks about how the rhetoric used against transgender people in restrooms sounds the same as the one used against African Americans, but we'll get to that later. There's a great Vox video on this exact subject, so if you want to learn more about what's in this section, I'll link their video here. Before gay sex was legalized in many places, public restrooms were one of the only places gay men could meet other gay men. There's an old slang word for this, cottaging, because the restrooms these guys would hook up in were called cottages. This one article from The Independent from 1998 said that a large amount of people who frequent these places started when they were teens to explore their sexuality in private in a society that wouldn't accept them publicly. Sometimes they would develop certain foot motions to signal to someone in the next stall that they were down, or that someone not in the loop was coming. One example of people who weren't in the loop is Queen's University, who tried and failed multiple times back in 2006 to prevent this. They thought to lock them at night or even install cameras to see who was going in, but eventually decided to just close them entirely. At the time this article was published, the restrooms had been closed for two years. This one park in 2006 was having the same issues. The police were trying to stop it, but they were sure that they weren't being homophobic. There is a problem with public sex in Marquiton Park, but we do not want to demonize the gay population, because it is not just gay people who use the toilets for sex. Don't know how much the police's word on anything is worth in general, but especially in this case, because a member from a gay support group said that the police need to apply the law to straight and gay people equally, so... There are over 40 million Americans with disabilities today, and they often struggle to find public toilets that they can use. According to this article from the National Museum of American History, if someone with certain disabilities wanted to ride on a train not too long ago, they would have to wear a diaper because the restrooms weren't accessible. With a lot of veterans coming home from World War II, people with disabilities got some visibility and attention, but still couldn't be sure they could use things like public transportation and toilets. It wasn't until the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 that public places and businesses were required to provide accommodations for people with disabilities. But as it always is with civil rights legislation, the problems didn't go away after the laws passed, and people with disabilities still have trouble finding restrooms they can use easily today. This Quartz article goes into detail about the story of a person who is 3 foot 5, and obviously has issues in restrooms with sinks, mirrors, and locks on doors that are much taller than her. She also discussed about how most of the discussion about making restrooms accessible is focused on people who need wheelchairs, like this image included in the ADA's guidelines. Further complicating things, some things that help those who need wheelchairs, like making sinks high enough to allow someone's knees to slide under it, doesn't help someone whose issue is that the sinks are too tall already. She mentioned how especially dehumanizing it is to have restrooms that don't care about her. She's right, because restrooms aren't just about where you can pee, they're also the way society communicates who it cares about and who it wants in public life. As we've seen in previous sections, a group not having access to proper restrooms directly relates to their ability to participate in society. The reason the ADA isn't being entirely effective is both that the parameters for what counts as accessible are way too narrow, but also that small businesses don't have to comply as much as a mega corporation like Walmart, which further narrows the sectors of society people with certain disabilities can go without worrying. In her Teen Vogue article, Emily Flores talked about her experience going to a small coffee shop with a friend and knowing she couldn't use their toilet, and then being forced to make the terrible decision to ask her friend to help her use the restroom or just go in her seat. As you probably imagine because of how important having access to toilets while away from home is and how stigmatizing it is to have to relieve yourself outdoors, homeless people deal with an incredible amount of shit when it comes to this. It also shouldn't surprise you that there are not nearly enough public restrooms for homeless people in cities with the largest homeless populations. 
The ratio of restrooms to people in San Diego is 1 to 27, and in LA, it's 1 to 126. OSHA, the government agency in charge of workplace regulations, requires workplaces to have one toilet per 15 to 25 people. While it obviously isn't a one-to-one -one comparison, it's safe to say that there aren't enough restrooms for homeless people. To make this even worse, evidence from both Washington DC and New York City show that the already inadequate number of public restrooms have been declining over recent years, even before COVID. Many toilets are in buildings that aren't open 24 hours a day, require fees, or require you to purchase something from the store before you can use it, like fast food places. This chronic lack of toilets increases the risk of disease. In 2017 and 2018, an outbreak of hepatitis A swept San Diego, killing 20 and making almost 600 sick. Grand juries had been telling San Diego to increase the number of public restrooms for homeless people since 2005 and attributed the main cause of the outbreak directly to San Diego's failure to take their advice. I'm making this video at about the one year anniversary of the COVID-19 lockdowns and these problems have only gotten worse. Public restrooms and things like libraries that used to be closed all night, closed all day. Public health officials urged people to wash their hands whenever they could and socially distance, which is painfully cruel to those forced to live on the street without enough restrooms. Skid Row in LA has around 8,500 people who are either homeless or in unstable housing. Because of the clear and dangerous threat of rapid spread through this community, the city installed the whopping sum of six hand washing stations. This incompetence and or negligence prompted a community action organization and UCLA to step in and install 30 more stations. The city followed up and took on the responsibility of installing more stations in the future and some porta potties, so at least they did something. In Washington, DC, city officials installed nine porta potties in homeless communities. But even this minuscule effort was challenged because apparently, some municipal authorities fear providing restroom facilities would be seen as enabling encampments, irking other local residents. By other local residents, I assume they mean residents who already have access to toilets. In addition to all of the health issues, the lack of enough toilets perpetuates the cycle of violence in the criminal justice system, where homeless people can be arrested for public urination and get marginalized further and put further into poverty. A terrible example that shows us just how important access to toilets are happened in 2017 in Anaheim, outside of LA. The closest public toilet to a homeless community was over a mile away, so local activists helped install three porta potties in the community. The Council of Orange County, not more than three days after the toilets arrived, declared them unauthorized and forced the activists to move them out of the county's jurisdiction and into the city's jurisdiction, who confiscated them. The city said the reason it didn't authorize short-term solutions like these porta potties was because it was focusing on long-term solutions, like removing the encampment altogether, which seems like an excuse not to help to me. Forcing homeless people to go in the tents they live in on the street or in plastic bags or bushes further perpetuates the cycle that isolates them from the public, gets them arrested, and keeps them from finding jobs. Looking at public restrooms illuminates how much governments want to avoid helping homeless people as much as possible. In 2017, Costa Mesa recognized how important access to public restrooms are for all of the reasons we've discussed, but still refused to act on it. The Sanitary District Board Vice President Jim Ferryman said this, If we find it's prohibitive cost-wise or everyone's afraid of it becoming a magnet for the homeless, that's another story. This echoes what officials in DC said about this exact issue, they don't want to encourage the homeless. They're worried if they give homeless people the basic human dignity to use a private toilet, homeless people might congregate and make other residents uncomfortable, which is the same philosophy when it comes to all other public spaces. These governments just want to hide the homeless, not help them. So I don't want to go in depth with the transgender restroom part of this video because I've seen so many great discussions of it and I don't really have that much more to add. So while I'm not going to look at this issue by itself, what I am going to do is talk about how it relates to the other civil rights fights in restrooms we've talked about. But trans people should be able to use whatever restroom they want. Remember earlier when we saw someone who went through the racially segregated restrooms related to the trans exclusionary restrooms? Yeah. An argument as to why restrooms needed to be segregated by race was to protect white women, which is very similar to, for example, North Carolina's recent language about their restroom bill. 
North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest said their law is worth it if it keeps one child or woman from being molested or assaulted. This ad from Houston showcases the same argument. Houston's Proposition 1 bathroom ordinance. What does it mean to you? Any man at any time could enter a woman's bathroom simply by claiming to be a woman that day. No one is exempt. Even registered sex offenders could follow women or young girls into the bathroom, and if a business tried to stop them, they'd be fined. Protect women's privacy. Prevent danger. Vote no on the Proposition 1 bathroom ordinance. It goes too far. While the language has shifted away from race, using protecting women as an excuse for bigotry has remained constant. Many also argue that this isn't a trans rights issue, but a states' rights issue. Much like what happened during the civil rights campaign, where racist segregationists would argue that the federal government was overreaching when it tried to outlaw segregation in the South. To bring it all the way back, this rhetoric used against trans people echoes the same rhetoric used by the South when defending slavery. Something I've seen echoed across multiple sources I've used in this video is that this isn't really just about restrooms. While of course the restroom specific aspects of this are important, restrooms are a symbol and a gateway to public life. Those who can't use restrooms that are open and accessible to them are being isolated from much of social life in general. If you want to go anywhere, be it a road trip across a state or a trip downtown by a bus, you need to have access to safe, consistent, and convenient public restrooms. So that means enough toilets for homeless people, no super long lines for women's rooms, no restrooms that exclude people with certain disabilities, and letting trans people use the restrooms they need, if we even need gender-separated restrooms anyway. If we want to build better societies that can be inclusive to everyone, we can start at restrooms. Anyway, thanks for watching. I know this is a really weird topic for a video. I never expected I'd make something about toilets, but it was actually really fun to research. There's a lot of really good stuff in these sources I use, so if you want to go in the description and check them out, I highly recommend it. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. I, I really hope you enjoyed it.